Hello, everyone. Hello. Your background, I think, totally wins, Tracy. It's my favorite sci-fi. The Expanse. The ex Expanse is great. I was a bit struggling after the first uh, season, the end of the first season. That, but yeah, I think it's it, it's definitely one of the most interesting ones. I liked all of the, uh, the the politics and stuff around it between all of the kind of reminds me of um, there was a really good uh, I think it was called the left the left hand side of darkness or the left side of darkness it's a really awesome sci-fi uh, it has a lot of about the different the different like planets and the, the the politics of it all And that's a piece of artwork that that I have behind me of the, the Tycho Station. I would I would love to have that in my house. <laughs> it's beautiful. So I'm still posting in here the link today for the agenda. As you already have some people here, I'll see it later on again for the co-chair and tech lead voting. Um, embassy submission deadline ended on Friday. Uh, I just have to wait for Amy to get back from her well-deserved vacation, which will be end of this week. So that's why I did not start with the voting process. I want her support there. And yes, I could have asked her uh during the uh, during her time off but i'm definitely not doing this to anybody so i decided if people take time off i know that they're reading uh slack so i'm not even posting to them so i hope every, everybody understands this and then we have to start with the official voting process so that's the reason why i didn't kick off immediately this week so i think it's important to honor be honor people's uh, time of work but we'll definitely get this done before kubecon so we'll there it's a lot of new people today that's that's actually amazing okay so let's give some people cross plane jared jared's over here on cross planes and jared i also posted some feedback already on the, on the due diligence document great work by the way yeah, thank you. I saw that uh, that feedback come in overnight here, and I'm definitely grateful for you spending some time to look through it, man. So thanks for making time for that. Yeah, we, we try to like work through those uh, as much as possible. Um, also, in my comments, I think the only critical piece for moving this in the time frame that you want to do is really, I think, agreeing on the end user interviews. These usually take some some time and some coordination. Yeah. But the, the earlier you can get started on these, uh, uh, I, I think, the better. Yeah, absolutely. I can I can facilitate making that happen. Uh, would that would that be with like you and Harry uh, as well yeah, too? Yeah, you can a second tier uh, TUC member, um, but they will obviously decide who to who to pick. It might be Cornelia in this case, uh, who's going to join. But Harry, having Harry on there, I think they can definitely help to get these scheduled. Awesome, cool. I'll definitely facilitate making that happen. Because he, from from experience, this is usually what takes the longest because it needs a lot of people to be coordinated across time zones. Right. Um, and uh, good. We have still some people joining. Usually, we wait until five minutes after the hour to get started. And then. So, so while we as while we are getting started here, if you are new and some of you are actually new to this group and want to quickly introduce yourself, feel free to do so while we are waiting. So we have one and a half more minutes to go. So feel free to just briefly introduce yourself to the group. Yeah, I can go. Um... 
I think we've spoken a little uh, on the end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but my name's Alex. So I'm currently working at JP Morgan, transferring somewhere else in a few weeks. But the app delivery group um, is extremely interesting to me, specifically around some of the, the challenges and opportunities that we see in infrastructure and application space. And I've been working a little bit with Jennifer and Thomas to, uh, to put some ideas together. I'm looking forward to, looking forward to contributing a bit further. And I'm uh, Tracy Reagan. I am on the board of the CD Foundation. We have an initiative to do more cross-pollination between the CDF and the CNCF. I'm also the community director for the Ortelius uh, Microservice Management Platform. I'm the CEO of uh, uh, Deploy Hub. Uh, yeah, I can, I can introduce myself. Uh, I'm Hong Chao Dan. I'm from Alibaba. Like, I'm not new, actually, I, I participate in in the sick uh, since the beginning but then like I, I'm, I'm i'm a colleague of uh harry so yeah so i also like participate in a lot of open source projects because that's what our team do i i also like uh contribute to cosplay and cook well i'm also cook well as well so yeah also working on the funding application to do it space yeah and i know that i still owe you a, a, a reply i was just like super busy until kubecon so expect the reply from me in the next one to two days as well <laughs> No problem. Yeah, I think Harry also like asked me to like yeah. help provide more input as well. Like so, we we are all work together. Okay, on the slides. I'm also new, so just introducing myself. My name is Anais. I'm currently developer evangelist at Codefresh, but I'm also similar boat to Alex. I'm also transitioning somewhere else right now. Um, yeah, I'm also a CNCF ambassador, so just looking into different calls and. You were Seeing actually super famous do. with Kubernetes, 100 days of Kubernetes. Oh, you know that. <laughs> that's something everybody should know about, yeah. That's, yeah, I mean, if there's something that I can like collaborate on and help with and also share in my YouTube videos, that would be amazing. So just, yeah, it's basically for those who, are, who haven't come across it, which I guess are more people, as it's a challenge that I set myself out to do when I got started in the space, which is like learning Kubernetes across 100 days and just showing people how they could follow a similar path, I guess. Uh, and my name is Robert, and I'm, uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to be more active in these kind of groups. So this is one of the, uh, the uh, things that I thought kind of fitted my working, uh, I guess my, my work hobbies. Uh, I'm a cloud architect from uh, in Crayon in Norway, and I'm currently working at in the GitOps uh, working group as well. So trying to do a little bit of everything, but, but just trying to be more active. Hey folks, oh. my name is Dan, um, and I work on Crossplane. I'm a maintainer of Crossplane, so I'm here uh, for Jared's uh, presentation of our incubation proposal today. Um, I'm also a tech lead of Kubernetes SIG release. Very cool. I think we have a lot of new people. By the way, there's also, I posted the link, also the doc on, um, uh, for the, the, the meeting notes, which we try to keep there. Um, looking at the time, I want to give everybody a fair chance to uh, speak speak today and we want to start off with the cross plane incubation project which is uh, pretty exciting a pretty exciting project i think it has also a great logo by the way whoever came up with that logo i'm totally a big fan of it so i'll just pass it over i think to jared you want to present yeah absolutely uh, I'll, I'll take it here thank you so much for for uh letting us come and speak today and get a get an audience with the sig here uh definitely appreciate that and uh, we hear that all the time about the logo as well too that people people love the little popsicle and imagery around that so i'll pass that along to, to chris the designer he likes he likes hearing that <laughs> all right so let me get this uh presentation going up on the screen here in the agenda doc uh there is also um the links to this presentation uh and also i think the um the upstream proposal as well too and the due diligence documents that's all linked from the agenda document so you can uh play along at home with all three of those there let's dive into this um so my, my name is jared watts i am a co-creator and a current maintainer of the cross plane project um we are going to kind of dive into our proposal to move to the incubation phase here. Um, it could be about 10 minutes or, or less. So we'll try to get through this quickly and give everyone else time today to talk to. 
Oh, no, are you seeing the screen too, by the way? You're seeing the slides? Cool, so uh, let's talk about Crossplane. Uh, maybe a bit of a refresher for some folks in the audience here. Um, but basically it's an open source Kubernetes add-on that focuses in two main feature areas. Uh, the first one is around allowing uh, infrastructure owners or platform teams to create their own custom abstractions and sort of enable uh, their developer teams to be able to self-service and create the infrastructure that they need on demand. Um, Crossplane has a kind of a broad surface area across a lot of vendors, clouds, environments, et cetera. So uh, we also have created a, um, a consistent API across all those environments as well too. So we'll go into more details on both of those, but that's sort of the two main high level uh, feature areas or focus areas of the Crossplane project and its charter. Um, we first open sourced it back in December of 2018, so just over two years ago. And uh, we are also the creators of the Rook project as well too, um, which is a fully graduated CNCF project. So super happy to see the progress and adoption on that project also, and you know, taking Crossplane through the same sort of uh, maturity um, growth as well too. We first got into the sandbox uh, last year, June of last year. So it's been about nine months since sandbox entry. And um, we had our first 1.0 uh, you know, major stable milestone release uh, just a few months ago. So let's dive into some more details here. So let's first talk about you know, what do we mean when we're talking about platform APIs and custom abstractions and all that. So basically the idea here, this is the core concept of Crossplane, is that we enable you to assemble or bring together low level granular resources uh, that could be from multiple clouds, multiple vendors, multiple environments. And then you can expose those low level resources as a higher level abstraction, uh, you know, a self-service API that your developers can use to get the infrastructure that they need. A good example of this is around um, composing these low level resources of a GKE, node pool, network, et cetera, maybe some Helm charts as well too. Um, like for platform services like uh, you know, FluentD or Jaeger or things like that. And then taking those low level, res low level resources and then offering them as a simple higher level abstraction so that your developers can just interact with a simple cluster object as opposed to all of this uh, you know, complexity and details of the uh, infrastructure underneath. And then with that, you know, below that API line, below that abstraction, you can put you know, all sorts of your policy, organizational policy, specific configuration, um, and the developer just gets a simple uh, API to deal with or you know, a limited amount of configuration that you're letting, them, uh, you're letting them touch. This is all done with the Kubernetes API. So everything here is going to be you know, a Kubernetes object uh, that you can interact with basically anything that speaks the Kubernetes API. So a lot of the existing tools in the ecosystem are very compatible with, uh, with Crossplane because of that approach. And finally here, it's, uh, it's all declarative. So you don't need to write any code to build your own custom platform. You basically describe it and declare it um, you know, in, a, in a declarative way. So let's visualize that because that's maybe kind of hard to, uh, to kind of grok just by talking about it. But let's go left to right on this diagram here. So on the left of the diagram, we've got our application developers. And what they're going to interact with is a simple cluster object uh, that might have a couple configuration settings, such as the number of nodes they want in their cluster, or maybe the size of the nodes, like small, medium, or large. They get a very simple abstraction or interface to deal with there. Underneath the covers, behind the API line here, what we're going to see is a set of compositions that bring together all those lower level resources. So we have an example here uh, in AWS for a cluster. You might have EKS and then VPC and all of its friends. And then for G uh, GCP, you're going to have GKE, network, subnet, et cetera, and all those. So the example we're showing here is that a simple cluster object can be you know, something in AWS. It can mean something else in GCP. But um, that's you know, one example of multi-cloud sort of thing. It could also be all within one cloud as well, too. You could have a composition for like a fast and a slow instance or an expensive and a cheap instance or gold and silver or whatever. Um, you know, you can have multiple compositions that satisfy this simple abstraction at a higher level. Um, the, so the low level granular resources are probably exactly what you think they'd be. Um, they're basically, you know, cloud services, on-premises infrastructure, all sorts of stuff could be represented as a CRD in Kubernetes. So extend the uh, control plane with the knowledge of new types and things outside of the control plane. Um, so for instance, uh, Amazon's relational database service, RDS, there is a CRD in Crossplane that represents the RDS service. Um, the user can you know, configure all the different settings on RDS they want to and, you know, interact with the low level resource there. There's a controller in the Kubernetes control plane that's watching for changes to that RDS CRD 
and then it's calling out to Amazon's APIs to you know make basically make the actual states in Amazon match the desired state that's on the CRD. And so these are the low level resources that we you know can compose together to form higher level abstractions on top. But they're probably exactly as you would have guessed. They're CRDs and controllers. So let's talk a little bit more about the uh, the cross plane resource model as well too. So you know, as we've seen, the cross plane extends the Kubernetes control plane with a whole bunch of different providers, environments, vendors, types, etc. And so we quickly realized too that it would be very useful to have a consistent API or a standardized way to interact with all of these uh, different types of resources um, that you know cross plane supports. So um, you know, basically, uh, you can think of the cross plane resource model or XRM as we call it. Uh, as an extension of the Kubernetes resource model. Um, there, it adds some opinions to the, the Kubernetes resource model and basically with the intent of providing a consistent management experience and API across all these different vendors. Um, you know, what you end up with is that all the objects, uh, you know, for Amazon RDS or Google Cloud SQL or whatever it may be, or even abstractions and compositions on top of those, they're all going to have a similar shape and behavior to them. So, for instance, things like cross resource references, like one reference, or sorry, one resource, depending on a field and another reference, uh, sorry, another resource, that's all going to be, you know, very consistent across all of the different vendors and clouds. Um, you know, status conditions are going to be fairly similar. The way you do uh, credentials and get connection information to connect to resources like databases, caches, clusters, et cetera. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that we've made some commonality and a sort of consistent API across all these different resources and abstractions, et cetera, and kind of make some more sense of it and have a reasonable way to deal with all of them in a consistent manner. Let's talk about what we've done since Sandbox. So that was about nine months ago. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we had our 1.0 release. That was probably the biggest thing that happened in the last nine months is that, you know, we have with the 1.0 release, we've declared the core APIs to be stable and that the project is ready for production usage. In response to that, we've seen uh, end user adoption increase and people start taking it into production as well, too, now that the project has reached a, a certain amount of stability and, you know, backwards compatibility and, and things like that. Um, in addition to that, something that I even find myself to be more exciting is that the non-trivial contributions we're getting from the greater community have picked up uh, as well, too, so that people are deploying it to production. They're you know, having a use case that they think is important to them, and then they it basically will implement that upstream uh, for the benefit of the greater community. So seeing those non-trivial contributions come in from, from you know, outside of the core maintainer set has is, is been really, really exciting. Um, you know, we're also working with um, a lot of partners in the ecosystem and doing a lot of collaborations with uh, various um, CNCF projects as well, too. I've got a whole bunch of different links here for each one of those that you can you know, click through and learn more about. Um, I might want to give a quick shout out there to Dan on the call that yeah, you know, he's been doing a live stream show that basically you know, every couple of weeks does an integration with another CNCF project about how we you know, open policy agent, Falco, et cetera. Um, so that's been really cool to see ways that Crossplane is compatible with or can work alongside other projects in the ecosystem. So a lot of cool links there. Um, another, another thing here is our pack, we have a package manager. We did a V2 of that where basically say you have a, uh, you know, a bunch of platform APIs you've designed and they have dependencies on maybe provider AWS, provider GCP, provider Alibaba. And so you can basically declare, hey, this platform API needs these providers and we'll handle those dependencies for you. We'll fulfill them and make sure they're installed um, and available for you. And then you can do upgrades and rollbacks and stuff as well too. So that's been really nice for the maturity to be able to you know, version and um, iterate on the, the providers and, and things that are installed in your cross plane clusters. And then finally, we did a really successful community day event alongside of our 1.0 release. Um, and we had a really awesome speaker lineup there uh, with some of the creators of Kubernetes as well, too. So that was really fun to see the community get together and, and have some really awesome um, time that we all spent together there. Um, so let's talk about a couple of stats real quick. So as I mentioned, Sandbox entry was nine months ago. And uh, a lot of stats have increased by 50% since then. Um, some of them are, are even further, like container downloads, we're seeing a 10x increase in. And then also our Slack members have uh, increased 2.5x. The, um, that's where we uh, congregate mostly is in Slack and we collaborate with the community pretty heavily there in addition to GitHub. So it's nice to see more people coming in there, asking questions, answering questions as well too, and kind of participating together in that community there. Uh, and then uh, getting close to wrapping this up, 
uh, let's talk about some of the uh, partners and adopters. Um, those are kind of outlined in more detail in the due diligence and the upstream proposal. Um, but some I kind of want to highlight here real quick is the is Deutsche Bahn. They've you know adopted Crossplane into production, and I, I find it, I find them interesting because you know they're the largest railway operator in Europe. So seeing an enterprise of that size kind of take Crossplane into production has been really pretty pretty impressive. Accenture has been a huge help to them. Uh, kind of you know guiding them and helping them get get that uh, all deployed and, and and find success with Crossplane and they've also been a huge um, you know source of feedback and um, you know collaboration to contributions to the project as well too so that that's been great Cloud Checker is kind of interesting I think too because they're uh, what they're basically doing is they're replacing their Terraform usage with Crossplane they're buying in and they're adopting uh, this the, you know a control plane approach as opposed to a single one off you know infrastructure as code tool execution they you know they're buying into having a control plane manage all their resources instead. Um, so I think that's interesting. And the last one is Mothership is interesting too, because not only are they, you know, building platforms, custom platforms for their developers and, you know, being able to provision infrastructure, but they're also extending uh, cross plane and writing new controllers to do day two operations. So kind of ongoing operational tasks uh, are being implemented by them as well too, which is kind of is pretty interesting. I'm happy to see that. Um, so final slide here. The uh, there's links to all the resources for the project. Uh, the upstream PR is 620 in the TOC repo, and there's a link to the due diligence documents as well too. Started to get some feedback on there, and really appreciate that. Um, and then also some other you know general project resources there uh, that you can peruse as well too. Um, so I think that's all the resources there. All my spiel. Uh, thank you super uh, super much for listening. And um, you know I don't know if we have a lot of time for questions today with the agenda, but um, I'm always available to, you know, if you ask questions on the due diligence document or the you know, proposal 620 upstream, uh, we're happy to engage and get everyone's questions answered, um, make sure that everyone's everyone's getting the information that they need. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for presenting. Obviously, we open it up for questions. So we do have some time uh, for questions, looking at, the, at least five minutes. So I definitely want to open it up for people that can ask some questions. Okay, if nobody starts, and I start with a question that I was actually having when looking at Crossplane. First of all, I think it's a great project. I think it's really helping to model these resources, and it's a very interesting use case of Kubernetes for like really using that Kubernetes API server and, and, and operator pod, um, model in there the controller model. My first question is, how do you handle security? Um, I mean, obviously, you're giving developer the freedom to create CRDs, which might on um, behind the scenes create a massive amount of, of resources and um, something we've seen also uh, when, when looking at, at, at resource modeling that they're, they're usually the rights that you need to create the individual resources in the cloud are kind of different from the rights that you need to create your own cluster. So what's the, the security model uh, or how do you model security and access control, more access control actually than security? Uh, in yeah. Yeah, I yeah, agree. Great, great question. And so and that touches on something that's that's really a foundational concept in Crossplane is this whole idea about separation of concerns. And so there's kind of, I didn't really get into it too much, but there's kind of multiple uh, personas that are going to be interacting with Crossplane on different sides of the API line, let's say. So your infrastructure owners, your platform team, you know, they will have full access uh, to, you know, define these platform APIs, to assemble resources together, to express policy, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, that's, they have this one persona that has, you know, a certain high level of access. And then with the abstractions that you build on top of that, uh, you know, those are intended to be consumed by lower level, you know, lower privilege uh, application teams, and they're very focused, they're scoped. So you can do, uh, you know, Kubernetes uh, RBAC uh, to all of those resources. So for instance, this cluster object, you know, you can grant access to that uh, and only that object to your developers. Um, and so they can interact with the specific configuration on that object, but they have no access to the underlying resources themselves to edit them or tweak them or to skirt your policy or anything like that. So the separation of concerns is, uh, you know, a pretty major uh, architectural uh, aspect of the crossplane uh, design um, that kind of, you know, helps separate out who gets access to what. Um, something that's also fairly interesting too that, you know, access is granted on the abstraction and not to the underlying resources specifically, is that um, you, know, you can programmatically determine like what are the IAM roles that you would need in a cloud provider in order to be able to do 
or uh, you know operate on all of the types that are going to be underneath the lower level resources. So you can kind of make sure that you know you have a good understanding of those. You can lock that down, et cetera. But the separation of concerns thing is is really really important concept for the security model. Um, and Dan, do you have anything that you would want to to add to that to kind of flesh out that thought a little bit more? No, I, I think that was a, a pretty good covering uh, of the offering. I will say that's uh, definitely a big uh, proponent uh, of crossplane um, compared to something like infrastructure as code tools, um, where your level of abstraction, uh, your permissioning does not match that. Um, I also would point to uh, some of the resources uh, on the crossplane blog, um, where we have some kind of like compare and contrast with uh, additional models uh, or, or traditional models uh, of infrastructure abstraction. Um, yeah, thank you. Because I think that that's one of the key points for something like this to work. Uh, because obviously you need like very different rules for like the lower level resources than for the high level concepts. Uh, um, I think that, that that would be well worth if you, if you could maybe also edit. I mean, it's not necessarily part of the due diligence uh, document, but I think it's an important resource to have somewhere, especially how you handle um, this type of access control, because uh, like one of the work streams in SIGAP del delivery always was, okay, how can we provide kind of like higher level primitives for people to work with? Um, and where you say, well, it's not just about helm charts. There are some, especially when it comes to access control, it starts to get a bit more complex than just pure composability. So I, th I think that that by itself would be an interesting topic to, to discuss. Um, a, another question, a second question that I would have is um, obviously some of the cloud providers, and you also mentioned it in the due diligence document, they're kind of like building, I wouldn't say like their own uh, controller versions, um, well, to some extent that they, they do. Uh, so, so how far along are you that they would, um, and again, that shouldn't be like just one solution out there, but how's your collaboration with them or do you have some joint plans that maybe XRM is a model that is going to be adopted by multiple of them or, or by like the major cloud providers uh, for their resources as well? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good question as well, too. And I took a note, by the way, too, to update the due diligence document with the security model and, and access permissions and all that sort of stuff. So I'll, I'll, I'll incorporate that into the doc. Um, yeah, so for, so for you know, the cloud provider um, APIs and uh, partnerships with them. So basically, um, you know, the concept of bringing external resources such as a cloud provider managed service into the management purview of the Kubernetes control plane is, is not an, a concept that's exclusive to cross plane now. Um, other, the cloud providers are starting to do some of their own uh, projects as well too, that you know, basically enable you to create CRDs for the um, you know, resources that belong in their cloud, right? And so uh, we actually have a pretty strong set of partnerships going with uh, all the major cloud providers there. Um, AWS is probably the one that's furthest along, I think. So AWS has uh, the ACK is the name of their project. Um, it's you know uh, Amazon's controller for Kubernetes, and so um, you know we view those as kind of uh, low-level resources that you can use to directly control the AWS API. AWS API. So we've partnered with AWS and hooked into their code generation pipelines, so that you know services in AWS and generating code for the ACK controllers are in the same process can be used to generate code for the crossplane providers as well too. So I think there's, you know, there's space for both of those projects where, you know, ACK or something specific to Amazon, you know, if you're want to, you know, lives exclusively in the AWS ecosystem and, you know, only consume those APIs, not and not necessarily have any sort of abstraction capabilities on top of it, then you can choose to live, uh, live in that ecosystem. Um, but if you want to do anything cross cloud, or you want to have some sort of consistency across cloud providers, or if you want to start building abstractions with the machinery and cross plane, then I think that's, uh, you know, a really strong story to start getting, uh, you know, consuming or, or using the cross plane project. And then at the end of the day to the, you know, collaboration with these uh, cloud providers are doing it with Azure as well too, starting with GCP, um, you know, have a decent relationship with Alibaba as well too. Um, at the end of the day, what I would like to see is the uh, cloud providers themselves, you know, become maintainers and take ownership of the cross plane provider. And so I think a nice step in that is sharing code generation pipelines and then continuing to increase the amount of collaboration between the projects. Um, so they become owners of the cross plane providers as well too. Yeah, I think that, that that's exactly my point. And maybe the CNCF can then also help once you move into incubation to make it more 
um, attractive, obviously, for them to do so, because I think that's in the real value. Um, I mean, when you actually go in there and say, I want, I don't know, a load balancer, and I can get a load balancer on GCP, as well as I could get it on AWS or Azure. Because, um, I'm just kind of curious how closely you're working with them, because all of them have their own resource model, like Azure has ARM, you have CloudFormation, obviously, on the AWS side, and Google has also their own version of this model. So that's uh, that. That was my own thought. Only thought. Okay, but which is also not part of the due diligence. But whether you have some clear ideas on how to bring cloud providers closer together on something that's like really core, like the core service models that they have, which kind of differ between those cloud providers a bit more. Maybe it would be a nice idea where you could where it's it, where they also would like to learn more about like which resources do you see lend themselves well to. Um, say more like a an agreement across cloud providers and which just don't because they're so specific on on the individual cloud providers um but again it goes beyond the scope of cross plane i just think it's it's a great opportunity there where um ideally we would see more yeah i i totally agree with that yeah i think that that's a really good point and that's that's something that's really nice with the you know flexibility of the abstraction model in crossplane as well too is that you know the there, it's more of a framework or a tool set to be able to define lots of different uh, abstractions and compositions etc so we're not necessarily stuck to any lowest common denominator single you know abstraction of truth uh that everybody has to use there's lots of opportunities to create more flexible abstractions that you know fit use cases uh some use cases, use cases better than others but also you know do our best at creating more unifying abstractions as well too so there's definitely opportunity to keep um growing uh that those endeavors there i think yeah i, I just see the opportunity that at some point xrm or a combined version like working with the other cloud providers on xrm might become its own maybe sub project even mm. i would not like do it right now say that it necessarily needs to happen but once at, at some point we, we want to have maybe the definition independent from from the implementation um but that's maybe a discussion for for another day yeah and i see that being a trajectory that we can go in as well too of like the the next step is kind of more formalizing the xrm and, and putting a more formal definition to it and then you know letting it mature that way and, and giving us opportunities to perhaps you know make it an independent thing i can yeah, see that and, but you're already working with alibaba and, uh, and microsoft is also working on oam so I, I might see this at some point maybe not converge but, but getting closer yeah so, thanks for for Sharing. I'll open it up once more for question before we jump into a working group proposal. I had one Please question Henrik, around. I just had a... oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Um, I was going to ask quickly. Around... Oh, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, just in terms of how you bring um, existing resources under management, um, that would be a. Um, I know you have these uh, dynamic and statically provisioned resources but is it is it that you just have to start with uh nothing or does you have a pattern for bringing existing resources under management as you yeah yeah as support that, that, hmm? yeah great question great question and yes there is a pattern for that kind of a, an adoption model where you can have existing resources out there in your cloud providers um and then the you can basically you know create a cross-plane uh you know representation of that a crd that matches that resource and uh, there's an annotation that's called external name. And then you set that to be the name of the resource in the cloud provider. And so when it, uh, when, that, uh, me, when that annotation is matching an existing resource, Crossplane will kind of adopt that resource and say, okay, cool, this already exists. Let me get all the configuration. Let me populate the CRD. Let me make sure that, you know, now this is under management of Crossplane and have kind of adopted into the control plane. So that is set up to, to do that, to take existing resources and bring them into the management of, of Crossplane. Uh, one interesting aspect of that, an extension of that, is that um, I think there would be two use cases or two uh, variations of that. One could be maybe you want Crossplane to manage it and you want to be able to update it and change values over time. Another one could be you want it to be observe only. You want it to be a read-only resource where you want to adopt an existing resource that maybe it's managed by another tool, but you can have it in the control plane of cross-plane in a read-only fashion so that other resources can reference it and pull values off of it. Uh, cross-plane won't update it or manage it, uh, so it would be a read-only sort of thing, but it's then still available in the cross-plane control plane for references from other resources. And that's not supported yet. The observe-only concept isn't supported yet, but that's on the roadmap uh, in, the, in the near term. Thanks. 
So this is Henrik. I just had a quick question. So in, in some ways, it seems like this is um, a superset of, of what's available in cluster API. Can, can you quickly comment on that? Uh, yeah, and hey, Dan, you've, uh, you've been working with cluster API uh, specifically on in a number of dimensions. Do you want to take that one, man? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm sure a lot of folks here are already familiar with how cluster API works. Um, but it has a similar model where it has uh, core components uh, and then providers uh, for different, you know, Kubernetes offerings, um, whether they be, uh, you know, a hosted offering uh, like GKE or EKS, um, or it's, you know, spinning up EC2 instances and installing Kubernetes um, with kubeadmin or something like that. Um, so it, it's, you can envision it kind of as a very focused uh, version of Crossplane in terms of it targets very specific infrastructure and much of that is kind of hard coded. Um, one of the things that we've worked on with the Cluster API community um, and we're continuing to develop is using Crossplane um, as a sort of backend for Cluster API. So you can imagine that uh, their providers uh, are very scoped. So for instance, the GCP provider for uh, Cluster API uh, exposes a, a machine type and a cluster type. Uh, the cluster type, uh, its controller when it reconciles uh, creates things like a uh, VPC uh, or a, a, a network is what it's called on GCP, um, some security groups, subnets, et cetera, kind of all of the peripheral things uh, around setting up a cluster. And then the machine would be actual uh, compute instances on GCP. Um, so, so that cluster type uh, has those components that it creates hard coded in the controller. Uh, on, on the contrary for cross plane, you can design sort of your abstraction so something like a cluster type um, dynamically by writing yaml and mapping it to granular resources so the gcp provider for crossplane uh, instead of exposing a kind of abstract cluster type that provisions a bunch of network is going to expose actually all of those um, granular resources so um, the subnets the project the um, et cetera, all of those different things that it would be required uh, would be granular resources and then you would define a cluster type um, that that basically maps to all of those, uh, which makes it a little bit easier, right, for a user to be able to configure exactly what it means uh, when you're setting up a Kubernetes cluster uh, on GCP, and that can be changed and repackaged in in minutes or seconds, as opposed to you know having to rewrite the controller um, and, and rebuild it and that sort of thing. Um, so there's a lot of advantages to that, and you actually because the uh, cross-plane composition model allows you to um, you know kind of define any schema that you want uh, we've actually shown a demo of uh, being able to take that gcp cluster type and the cluster api controller um, create an xrd the composite resource definition with crosswind that defines a new schema um, and have that map to those different granular resources um, so instead of having a single controller that watches that and creates all of those different resources on gcp you have a controller that watches that abstract cluster type um, spits out those granular resources, which then cross planes provider GCP has individual controllers for each of those resources to go and provision them. Um, and, and you can imagine, right, you could change that mapping to, to your liking at runtime um, with cross plane. So we like to envision cross plane as kind of a potential back end for cluster API. Um, and in the short term, that likely looks like having kind of a uh, cluster API provider that's backed by Crossplane, in additional to the work that they've done on all those individual ones, um, and it, it's my belief in the long term um, that that would be a kind of desired direction to go, right? Because it does allow for much more configurability and customization uh, by end users. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks, I have to jump in here because there's lots on the agenda. I mean, it's good that we have this discussion. We might want to do maybe one thing a session specifically on XRM and dive deeper into those questions. If uh, people are interested, I still want to give the others, especially the working group uh, proposal, a chance to to present as well. And somebody has to play the, the guy who watches the clock and I unfortunately have to be today. And I want to give uh, the team here a chance to propose what they're doing because it is kind of related, not directly, but kind of related. So I think it fits very well in this segue here. Okay. So, it's, so it's, thanks uh, for the opportunity to yeah. appreciate it today. Okay. Um, yes. So um, as Arlo has announced before, um, we are talking about a real um, similar topic to that what we heard before. 
Um, we are, uh, so, so we are Jennifer, uh, Alex and me, um, we put our hands to our heads together and um, try to discuss such things as bringing infrastructure and applications together. Um, and therefore we came to the currently working, um, working title application enablement working group for that. Um, yes, and I think we'll try to dis try to describe this in the next few slides. Okay, so um, <clears throat> at first we um, we identified a bit of a problem. So um, application delivery and deployment is often about artifacts and their configuration, but um, all of these um, artifacts and the con uh, artifacts need infrastructure at some point. And at some point, so. Um, as we heard from, from, from Crossplane before, um, we have databases, we have file storages, we have message queues and so on. Um, and at some point in time, we, um, we might deploy applications um, and we might have um, a bit of a shared uh, of, a, of, a, of a board and resp responsibility between the application infrastructure um, developers and the infrastructure guys. And um, at some point, we want to apply application configuration um, or deploy applications, and there might be infra infrastructure components which are not available in the in the target infrastructure. So um, think about the development um, stage of an of an deployment. Um, you configured uh, an EFS provisioner by yourself, and you try to push the to to provision the, the same application to a staging or production environment. And there is not, uh, the, the EFS provisioner is not um, deployed there and therefore the deployment will break. Um, and we think that there's almost no solution. So you could um, um, obviously do, do something with Crossplane regarding this, but there's almost no solution which handles both infrastructure and application deployment. Um, but we also think that end users might have found ways to deal with this. Um, so um, they, they, they might use Terraform, Pulumi, Crossplane for infrastructure deployment. Um, and they might use Argos, Binecker, or Captain for the application de deployment. And they might um, put, uh, do a link via CI tool or other, other different things. Um, but um, we also think that there are no best practices at the moment. And this is a gap which we, we as, the, as the CNCF working group could fill. And um, yes, Alex will tell you what we, what we think about application enablement. Thanks, Thomas. Yeah, so just to give some annotations on, the, on those previous points and just to add to that, you know, we, we look at things like the service mesh working groups and we look at things like SMI spec and how that's a ubiquitous spec that's an agreed upon standard across vendors and across cloud platforms. And we think about that kind of standard as, a, as an end goal, but more immediately, we think about application enablement as being the anecdotes that we kind of pull together to understand what are the best practices. And when I was trying to work with Jennifer and, and Thomas, we, we came up with sort of this, this sentiment here of, and I'll read it out, you know, application enablement is accomplished by describing the requirements for an application workload to operate within a hosted environment and provision components as they are required. This domain encompasses the pipelining, provisioning, and distribution of necessary underlying infrastructure components in a ubiquitous yet agnostic pattern to ensure applications are deliverable to any appropriate cloud native ecosystem. And you know, we've been speaking about this for the past sort of 30 minutes or so, but this resonates at so many points. And I think that now more than ever, we're really at a singularity where we need to have an opinion within uh, the CNCF uh, SIG of how this is how this is done in the real world, what the best practices are, and potentially where can there be um, you know, standardization. And, you know, if you don't want to use such a strong word, you can say at least attunement between methodologies. And so that's what we're looking to do. And, you know, just to double down on this, Thomas, if you go to the next slide, please. You know, I, I, I draw this very, very um, terse illustration. And, you know, we all understand kind of what I'm getting at, I believe, in that there are quite a few steps. And, and really, the application code doesn't get a look in, and there's no clear way to really describe what I'm doing here. You know, we talk about provisioning an ingress. We don't talk about the wait timeout that I have to introduce so that that IP address is provisioned as it's coming up through the stack. We don't talk about 
um, you know, how does the CI, the CI uh, provision its credentials to then execute a remote command to check if a health check passes? These are all the kind of discrete behaviors that companies throughout the world are having to introduce to accomplish this multi-layer process of application delivery and enablement. And so what we would like to be able to do in the SIG again is to sort of look at these kind of um, edifices of how do you deploy and how do you deploy on top of that uh, IaaS and figure out what are the most common patterns that we're seeing in utilization. And uh, Thomas, if you go to the next slide, please, you'll see that where we're trying to find um, our niche and where we're trying to sort of um, come together on here is looking at the infrastructure, the very strong infrastructure provisioning space and the very opinionated, very strong space in terms of CI/CD enablement. Um, you know, as we were, as we were introducing it on the call with you know folks folks like Tracy and and people from the the Continuous Delivery Foundation are thinking about and looking at the synergy there in terms of you know end game. How do we have some sort of specification schema standard opinion on what works really well together? What technologies potentially have projects that can grow out of them? And what could this working group foster in terms of collaboration? And so I believe that, and I hope that that kind of captures the sentiment. And with that, I'll, I'll pass on to Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer. Sorry, I was muted. Hi. Uh, yeah, so just summarizing here is it, and uh, putting this uh, matching with the big charter, uh, we are looking from the whole uh, end to end, right? From the application definition, uh, configuration, packaging and deployment, uh, the application delivery, uh, the workflow as well. And the, the yeah, and I already said the workflow, so. Uh, could you go for the next slide? Um, and our proposed goals here is like is to get the uh, find out about the current practices and the landscape because there's a lot going on at the moment, uh, various cutting edge stuff, and we yeah want to make reason about those and and make sense of what's going on. Give the end users the uh, ideas, examples. We want to run some POCs and see. Uh, how they could integrate that with the solutions we have now on the landscape. Um, we are also thinking of the personas here too. Uh, we don't want to overload uh, like operations, for example. We want to make sure that production engineering can, uh, be, can be able to uh, participate, get involved on that too. So um, balancing the involvement of various personas across uh, application delivery um, and provide best practices uh, through uh, what Thomas and Alex have said, could be standards, could be um, uh, some, oh, just some uh, recommendation or a white paper. Um, yeah, and as you can see in the future, possibly create a specific for handling infrastructure components in cloud native environments. Next slide, please. Um, as in Ante goes, we are not going to, to run something and then recommend a specific full chain. Uh, we want to look at an agnostic way and, and uh, present uh, the current, what is currently going on in the community, what people are using and uh, come up with an opinion, best practices. And I will just give back, send back to Thomas. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes. So we also thought thought about how we could um, how we could achieve our goals and how we could um, start using on this on these topics. And um, we thought in the first step we don't want to write another white paper because um, Jennifer and me, we wrote a white paper in the last few months. Um, and um, in the first step, we want to build something and um, want, to try, want to try to give the, give the end users something back, uh, which, which provides value, to, value for them, similar to the potato head. Um, and that they can try things out, that they can try to find out what could, what could fit best for them and so on. So we try to build something usable. And um, we want to achieve this by trying to integrate tools and find solutions. So um, I think there are many, many infrastructure as code tools, um, as Alex described before. And there are also a lot of CI CD tools um, which can be integrated. And I think everyone is interested in integrating these things. 
And after we found out uh, which solutions uh, there could uh, we we have on the market, and how how best practices could look like for such for such effort. Um, it, it might be that there are some some things which uh, we find out that uh, that aren't currently covered by anyone, um, and then we could um, build a white paper, a similar document, um, which under which is underpinned by our practical work. Um, yes, and in the future, as Alex said before, um, we could possibly possibly also design something like a like a uh, like a cloud infrastructure interface, so SMI like. Um, that there might be a database claim for databases, um, and it might also be that we create an abstraction uh, which um, creates a database and proxies that for the for the application, so that we need the that we also also need the endpoint of a database, uh, have the endpoint of a database, and um, possibly possibly also access control. But this is um, kind of um, a future topic. Um, yes, and this was our proposal. Um, I hope everyone liked it. And um, yes, um, we'd like to ask how we should proceed with this. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, we, we, we briefly talked before and that's what was encouraging uh, this, this work to be done. And as you mentioned, Jennifer, specifically, this is in line with a lot of what we want to do. To have like this application definition topic, whether it's on the application or underlying infrastructure topic, which is in like the last time I was talking about this on Twitter, I got roasted by some journalists that the Kubernetes doesn't have an app definition, and I should never say that. Um, I think it is important. Um, we also have harvesting data, where the work is already done around XRM. I think the idea that I totally like how different tools are doing it today and starting there is. Uh, is, is a great approach. I would definitely reach out to the existing projects to do something in a space, um, not just because it's nice to do things, that there are things there already. And um, then maybe also reach out then at some point to the end user community. Obviously, I think the working group makes sense. I'm still personally struggling a bit with the name because I think it's not immediately what it does. And I know every, the names are always hard to find. I think it hits a very important point that we also saw with XRM and others that we need a better way to define our application constructs, dependencies, and, and how we model something there. Um, so I'd, I'd say having like a charter and ideally reaching out to maintainers of those individual projects that you have already listed and what they see would fit in there, I think is just super important to get also their feedback. Mm -hmm. Um, on, on this topic, um, because the official, uh, the official setup of the working group is pretty straightforward. You propose chairs, then you define a charter, and then we go to the TUC. I think it needs a bit more work before we go to the TUC. What I would personally leave out for the time being is this SMI kind of thing. Who wants to be that kingmaker, and if it has this, okay, let's define a standard on top of. I don't think so. Jared already left, but I think they might not be super happy if you say like this is the Uber XRM model. And I know that you, that's not what you want to do. I mean, just making it uh, uh, easier to to digest and maybe having a couple of key uses that you key use cases that you want to address is is, is great. But also the examples obviously make make a lot of sense. So uh, it's it's interesting. I think everybody understands the problem, but then putting it into words still feels a bit hard, which kind of means we don't have a, even a word for what we, we're trying to do here. Also, we all agree on the problem. And that might actually also be the trick here, maybe to again put in that this is the problem that we need to solve that people run into. So that's how I would propose to to go forward and like start really the charter document, reach out to the projects, and then ideally have somebody from those individual projects joining you. Because the worst thing, and I'm coming from a standardization background, is a standard that nobody wants to implement. So what, what do individual projects want to adopt? What adopt? What do they already have available? Is there like a, a common agreement? Um, how are they complementary? I think that by itself is is a very great starting point to see what's what, what's there. But I think it's a it, it's great that we're moving in that direction. That was from the very beginning. I remember when uh, Brian, Harry, and myself started to to work on this. 
uh, so yeah, we need an application definition and make this easier and really move up the, the application stack here. So I think uh, great initiative to get started. And maybe we regroup what your findings are with those those, those other projects. Mm -hmm. That's also what I like about the seek to do more. Like in, in, in general, first of all, have more end user related impact. Well, I don't like the word end user. It feels finished like people who are actually using it on a day to day basis. And sometimes it's hard to say because I now obviously working with Thomas, he is an end user also. He's also working for a vendor, uh, like, like many others. Uh, I think that's an important part and obviously bring projects closer together to collaborate on problems that exist in the industry. And if you can do both together in a working group, I think then that's ideal. It's almost like me very long saying, it's a great idea. Talk to a couple more people and let's recoup the next time and see what you found out. Yeah. That's the TLDR maybe. That's good. And where are those? It might be, helpful. Those... Oh, it might be helpful to do a data model of what, um you're proposing kind of like you can look at the XRM or what um, what they've done and say like it um, overlaps with uh, you know what cluster API is doing um, that would be helpful and like in the area you're working on I would say like part of the model might be actually multiple applications right because in in, in a space let's say where you have 200 microservices you know there might be a, a, a hierarchy you might want to represent or some dependency that you might want to represent or you might want to encounter like environments being a, a first class citizen and um, rolling out applications. You talked about monitoring. Those are all kind of different parts of your data model. So if you have a data model of what you saw uh, your CRD looking at or CRDs looking like, uh, that would that would be helpful in terms of or even not thinking about a CRDs, but just in terms of how what is it that you guys want to model and that might be enough to describe in words you know like because those are written kind of what you see as your charter i was just curious if we can uh, uh is there a place for that slide deck is that the yeah we can drop it in we can yes i'll pop it in that would be great uh just in case uh Anybody else from the CDF would like to see what you're up to on the best practices? Yeah, team? I think putting the slide deck in there and also mm -hmm. starting the discussion with the charter document where people can chime in there. And I'm leaving it at the end to you to reach out to, to the projects and get things. People were also asking here where there's a specific Slack channel. Robert uh, was asking, yes, there is a specific Slack channel. There is the app delivery Slack channel so in the CNCF Slack, not in the Kubernetes Slack which is sometimes confusing for people. I think most, it's like that, you can go there or you can also use the mailing list. I think for most people go to the, to the Slack channel. And when we share something, we usually try to share it on both channels here. Yeah, I think we ran out of time today, which is good and bad at the same time. The good thing is we have a lot of things to discuss, a lot of momentum at a bad time. We have to postpone uh, some, of those conversations to the next time, like the operator working group update. Uh, that's maybe a very short one that the operator working group can do, but I'm afraid we won't be able to talk about conveyor today. So we won't have those 15 minutes. So I'd like to postpone it to the next time and use the last two to three minutes just for a very, very quick update on the operator working group progress. Okay. Um, yes, that's also me um, or us, let's say it this way. Um, so um, in the last, I think about two weeks before uh, ago, we've um, finished our collab collaborative review of the operator white paper. Um, so currently we are, uh, we are starting the, the next review phase or let's say the public comment phase. Um, therefore, I've, I've, uh, we've also uh, opened up a pull request um, which I will share afterwards in the in the um, Slack channel and on the mailing list. And um, it would be nice if some if someone of you would take a look on the operator white paper. Um, two comments. Um, if something is not really clear in the document, um, feel free to comment it or make proposals, suggestions, or whatever. 
Um, I think we'll uh, the public comment phase will take two uh, will two week weeks as we dis as I discussed with Arlos, um, and afterwards we will try to publish the the white paper. Um, yes, and that's that's all of our progress at the moment. So we we have no more content to present. So we are in the in the last steps. Yeah, that was a long time in the making. I think it's great. And then let's um, get this also shared maybe on the TUC mailing list once everybody feels comfortable to do so. Definitely something to have ready for KubeCon coming up. And yeah, we are up on top of the hour already. So I know Amy usually scales his meetings for 45 minutes when she knows that we're already running over. So I'm uh, causing some of you not having a break. Um, um, so for Conveyor, I'd, I'd really like to move this to the next one and then give them like the start to start to bite off with conveyor that they have a fair chance to present in two weeks from now. And otherwise, I want to thank every, all of you for your presentations. I think it was a very good and very well prepared meeting today. A lot of different topics. Also interesting to see topics converge on the working group side as well as on the cross plane side. So that's definitely great. And again, if you have any proposals for topics to present for the next meeting, feel free to post them in the agenda. We try to arrange them as, uh, as, as much as we can uh, and accommodate them. If you want to do a presentation, usually a good idea you've seen today, like if you stick something that to 10 minutes plus five minutes discussions, that's fine. If uh, topics go deeper, I'd rather schedule a follow-up than cutting it off and not coming to those points. Thanks everyone for today and hope to see you again in two weeks from now. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay, um, so I think we are in the operator working group meeting now. <laughs> yeah. Is it the same Zoom call? I just left. Same Zoom call, but I'm not sure if someone will join there. Okay. So um, Jennifer is also asking if there is an uh, operator working group now. Yeah. But I, but I also think we don't have much to discuss today. Okay. Uh, I guess I can, you know, I can, if, if there's anything I can help with in the review cycle, I'm happy to do so. Mm -hmm. um, yes, as we, as we talked before, um, we should make the, the whole wording a bit more fluent if possible. So if there's something you'll find there, okay. it would be nice if you could do this. Okay. And, I'll go through I'll go through the document again and look for more like not just grammar but also maybe like phrasing and you know taxonomy. Hello again. Hi. Hello. Um, so I think the operator working group will be will be very short short today. Um, so I talk, uh, Alex Alex and me talked about um, what we should do next. So. Um, I'll kick off the, the public comment phase now um, or, to, or tomorrow or whenever. Um, and afterwards, we should try to make the whole document a bit more fluent. So I think this is the thing we, we talked about as um, narrative voice and so on. Um, yes, to make it better readable and so on. And I hope. Um, Yes, and, and um, I hope in two weeks we have a final version of the operator white paper, um, which we uh, and I talk I also talked to Emily from the Sig Security, and she said um, we can 
uh, reach out to the help desk of the CNCF and they help us with publishing the white paper. So also make it making it pretty and shiny and whatever. Is this a uh, uh, public comment? Is that the TOC uh, going yes. to look at it? And uh, will we? I mean, if it's available tomorrow or something like we and we are making the narrative voice, like we do at the same time, then like the is, is like in parallel that we're going to be submitting the changes. Because it feels um, like it's going to be like a change everywhere. Maybe not. Maybe lots of chapters would want to keep the same, but to have the same flow, could, it could change the whole thing. So not sure. Um, we can also we could also um, start the public comment phase on Monday. So if you want, we can make we can try to make it a bit more fluent until Monday and start the public comment phase then. Okay. So I think okay. it's, I think from a time perspective, it's absolutely no problem at the moment. Because I think we, we, we said that we will, will be finished on the, on the, on the start of, of May. And I think we'll, uh, this, we can accomplish this. Okay, okay. I'll try to get on Friday some hours to do, look at that. But only if it's okay for you, we can also say we start the command phase on Wednesday. So for me, it's not absolutely no problem. But we should okay. start it at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, before the next uh, week. Now are we having CGAP delivery meetings the same day? We used to have every other, like, um, things like things change, right? No, I think the next CGAP delivery meeting is next week. Oh, okay. I heard you saying. I think so. From now. Do we have um, to do the uh, reaching out to the community by next week and the, pro and the other projects? Um, we could try this, but um, I don't think we have to. Okay. It might be good to start. I'm happy to help. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure we can guarantee that everyone will respond, but maybe we can at least say that we've put it in progress. And also maybe have a look at a draft charter. Yeah. Um, yes, um, I've I've created the document, uh, so the, the Google Doc in the in the beginning, in a way that it might be easily converted to a charter. So I copied that, this from the GitHub Working Group charter. Okay. And so I think we only have to add some things which we which we described in the presentation now, but then we can use this as a charter also. Um, and I would try to send out the charter as soon as possible to um, get a bit more more people in there. I feel like we would make this a lot more successful if Aloise uh, agreed with the name. So, yeah, that's difficult. I I, I did have um, I did have one other idea, and I don't think we mentioned it on the initial ideation on the document, um, and that was the word interoperability. So maybe we need to go and think about more names, but I'm not sure. He doesn't seem keen on it, on it though. Maybe he just needs to get used to it. Um, yes, I think some point with interoperability or integration um, working group would be cool. Yes. We can get uh, opinions from the projects as well as a good idea and users yeah. and stuff. And then. Yes. How how would you recommend? How would you want to contact them? Like, what's the best? What's the normal way? Um, I think there is no normal way. Yeah, so, it's um, just random. For the, for the for the operator working group, I often try to ping some people on Slack or some projects. Could we use um, Could we use the SIG app delivery channel because they'll all be in that yeah. channel and just say, "Hey, please participate and do like a Google survey or something." Or maybe maybe we wouldn't get enough people to participate. Um, I think in the first step, we could use the app delivery channel okay. and reach out and try, uh, try to find some people from, from there. How about I will um, DM us in our group. I'll put a, a sentence or two together and we can look mm -hmm. at it. And then I'll, if, it, if you think it looks good, I'll paste it. And then maybe I can just invite people to contact us if they'd like to participate or something like that. Yes, so absolutely okay. no problem. 
okay i'll take that as an action um at some point in time if you if we have um some people um which might join us um we can also schedule a zoom meeting for that um and um, yeah like the, the the guy that we met today, Laszlo, who's working on a similar problem space, would probably be interested in this kind of SIG, okay. sorry, this kind of working group. Yeah, so um, he would also be a good candidate for that. And also the cross-playing guys would be perfect candidates for that. Um, I'm not sure if we have something from someone from Terraform in the in the special interest group. But I think I saw some, I saw someone from HashiCorp there some time ago. I know that Tracy would be really interested, you know, because she represents not only um, uh, not only Deploy Hub but also the CDF, mm -hmm. uh, and I and I, I work quite a little bit on the CDF as well. So there's a lot of cross cross pollination. Yes, I was also uh, some uh, I also participated in some um, best practices meetings there. And I also think that this would be a topic which would be interesting for the, for the CDF. So it could also be that we do kind of a joint effort with this working group. I think that would be a really good idea, yeah. So um, yes, I think we could reach out to Tracy and try to find, try to find out what, what she thinks about this. Because then we would have a lot of more, uh, a lot, lot more people joining there. Yeah, yeah, in the in the other in the TOC and other bigs and stuff, there are people from end users. We can try to reach out to them as well and just mm -hmm. ping somebody to take a look. Um, Jennifer, I think you you were you were active in the end user com community, weren't you? Yeah, I was when I was not a vendor. <laughs> I'm trying okay. to reach to my colleagues to see if they are still part of, like if they renew their membership and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I just ping one of them, just waiting. And uh, um, I know also some people that work uh, CNCF. I'll just check if they they can like recommend someone to talk to or something. I'll just directly ping them. I think I, I have had good experiences pinging people just by themselves sometimes. Yes. So they, they are receptive sometimes, they, they just don't answer, but one or two answers. So we could try to get some some use cases. Um, does it have to be just by end users? Like if I talk to another company that's not yet, but they they would like to share the use case, would, would that be okay? Or do you think? It's absolutely no problem. Oh. So um, I, I will also uh, try to find some use cases. Um, to be uh, the company I'm working for is also a vendor, but I'm acting as a, as an end user, as Alice said before. Yeah, yeah. I will have a discussion tomorrow as well with my uh, couple of people in my team uh, because um, one person in my team is the chair for the SIG service catalog, and they are trying to like they are looking into the uh, Kubernetes uh, service binding spec. Um, and then we are going to discuss if there is any thing that's like, I, like such as use cases or mm -hmm. any shared interest that could be contribution or something. I, I want to understand more, but I, yes. I'll, I'll have a chat tomorrow too. We can, so I guess as an act, actions for us, so we will reach to these people, try to find use cases, some feedback. Um, should we, uh, like Alex said, start a, a charter draft and we can also give our, because we thought a few use cases, right? You had a problem, Thomas, you, you mentioned on our uh, working group proposal doc. So we could start with that, put something and then um, take it from there and then start to contribute asynchronously. So we don't need to arrange a Zoom meeting straight away. No, not really. So. Um... Um, yes, I can take the, the task to start writing the charter um and to um yes um i'll start writing the charter and share it to you both um afterwards and uh when we agree that this is an uh, a good starting point we can share it on the on the mailing list and on the slack channel but i would do this in a uh, uh in the next few uh, so I, I would like to share this in the next few days if it's possible yeah that's good i think that makes sense
Okay, then I think we'll get back some minutes or have a can cool. start the evening a bit earlier. Thanks very much. See you later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for the presentation. Bye.